Okay, uh, James Smith is a sysadmin at CultureAmp, a 100-person startup based out of Melbourne, San Francisco, New York and London, focused on employee engagement. In a previous life, he has been, uh, am I right, this is a barista, not a barrister? Yeah, barista. A, a yeah. DJ <laughs> and technical director for corporate events. He also moonlights as the audio engineer on the Mac Admins podcast making us sound a lot better than we do in real life. Uh, this is James's first time presenting at XWorld, and he's going to be talking about onboarding in a culture-first environment. Thank you, James. Excellent. <laughs> yes, that's Storm. Um, hello and welcome. Um, so we're going to be talking about onboarding today, um, and just so that everyone's on the same page, when I refer to onboarding, um, I'm talking about the first day or two of a new hire's experience at a company. Um, I'll be going through uh, specific details about pre-onboarding from the IT perspective, how systems are set up um, and before they arrive on day one, um, and also what the experience is like for employees when they unbox their new Mac. Um, so obviously some people aren't as excited about onboarding as I am. I'm hoping that you share my excitement and not like my friend Al. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yes, as Marcus said, I'm James. Um, the numbers actually increased now. It's 150 people that I work with. Um, and I'm SmithJW on Twitter, Slack. Um, you can find me there. Um, join if you don't. Say hi if you've got any questions afterwards. I'm always happy to chat about anything that I'm talking about or doing. Um, I can actually probably skip this because Marcus already talked about what I do. <laughs> Um, all right, so just kind of a little about where I work uh, before I get into the meat of the presentation. Um, we're an Australian company founded about seven years ago um, to give companies data and metrics to make uh, better people decisions. We're doing this with an intuitive survey platform uh, with real-time analytics. Um, in a nutshell, we, we do surveys, but we just do them a bit nicer than some, some other places. Um, so obviously we were founded in Melbourne and we've got offices in San Francisco, New York and London. Um, and kind of, so this talk is onboarding in a culture first environment and I live that and I breathe that. So not a lot of people know what kind of culture first is. So I've tried to distill it down. It, it's, it's a hard thing to talk about, but basically um, it's, being a culture first company means you're prioritizing the creation and curation of a healthy culture that aligns with your org's um, values and goals. We really try to put people first in a lot of the decisions and that's what drives a lot of, um, a lot of um, what I'm doing with onboarding. Um, so where do we start? Pretty good. You know, a new person would start, they'd come in and there'd be all this brand new gear on their desk. It was nice. Um, how many jobs kind of have, ooh, I'm picking up by that microphone too. Um, how many jobs have you walked into? We've just got a pile of goodies waiting for you. The problem was that's where kind of those good times ended really, because it was a manual process. The hiring manager would get in touch with the new camper. That's what we refer to ourselves as. Um, and kind of ask if they had any special preferences about their Mac. Um, they'd then go and kind of email the local Apple store and order a computer. And then that would lead to every single person having different spec machines. And, you know, sometimes they wouldn't show up on time. Um, and also things like accounts might not have been created because there was no IT back then. So the hiring or the office managers would be creating the Gmail accounts and all of that. Um, and it kind of, kind of, it only got worse from there. So once they'd unwrapped everything, I'm just going to show this little screencast of the setup assistant, which is great. You know, it goes through, but there's a lot of steps in there. Um, and also at this point, there was no management to speak of, no kind of admin account, no Apple remote desktop, nothing. We just kind of handed people a computer and said, be free, kind of do what you will. Um, so. And also back then, there was only kind of pseudo IT, still kind of me, but really I was in Melbourne and everyone else across the, if there, basically if there was a problem, it would take hours to resolve because they're emailing from San Francisco or New York and yeah, it's not great. All right, once the Mac would set up, they'd move on to 
SaaS services. Um, they'd get a temporary password, kind of a, a sticky note from their manager. It had been generated when um, their account had been created, if it had been created. Um, this post-it note was often stuck on their computer for just there for a couple of days before that person started. So anyone kind of going past could just grab that. Um, you know, the password, it's a secure password, but it's hard to type. Um, but yeah, it's pretty secure, huh? It's not great. <laughs> um, so next, they'd proceed to Gmail, um, where they'd kind of log in. And this is sped up, obviously, because um, of the amount of services. Um, and I kind of got through it a bit quicker because I had a password manager when I was creating this. Um, now, I did used to actually show all the services, but um, my security guy said, I can exploit you through each of those. You've got to hide all that stuff. <laughs> Thanks, security. Um, so after kind of going through all of this stuff, it'd probably be about half an hour or so actually trying to get it all set up. Um, it's not a fun experience on day one. Um, so where are we now? We've, and how did we improve that process? So we start the same way, um, and I'll talk about how we actually get all of that gear and get those preferences now. Um, we're now sharing a temporary password via LastPass, and that goes out to, once the account is created, that temporary password is stored in LastPass and actually shared with the various onboarding people in the offices so that they know they can get that in a secure manner. It's also a bit easier to type now. It's still secure, you've still got more entropy because it's a longer password, but it's a lot easier to kind of communicate, hey, go and type this in now. Um, basically now what we're also doing is we've got that little URL for a setup guide. So that then links off to Confluence uh, where I've stepped out the process for setting it up if they've got any questions. Um, now the only problem here is in order for people to now set up their Mac, they need to have set their password. To set their password, they need a Mac. So it's kind of this, <laughs> it doesn't work very well. Um, so in this guide, what I'm actually doing is I'm asking the, the team lead to um, kind of open up a, an incognito window, put in the temporary password, and then kind of hand their Mac over to someone. It's not kind of great, so I'm now kind of giving people um, an iPad to do the, um, the reset, resetting of the passwords and setting that. Um, and then obviously we go from here, then the new camper can go through and, and step out what they need to do. So this is a demo of what it actually, of what that process looks like. Uh, why aren't you working? There we go. Oh, I had such a good video. No. Oh, damn. Why isn't it working? I spent so long on that. I did restart before this. Oh, was it doing it? Ah, uh, oh, damn. All right, I'll skip that part. Oh, so good. Um, <laughs> it's so, so good. Um, so now we've got this uh, DP workflow. Uh, so all the Macs are enrolled. I skip basically all the steps. They just have to put in their username and password. Then they set up their account. Um, and then what happens from here, they'll hit the desktop and about 10 or 15 seconds later, you'll see this nice little splash screen come up. Um, now, this will go ahead and show the user that a whole bunch of stuff is happening. At the end, they'll be logged out. They log back in and File Vault is turned on. And now they're kind of ready to go with their computer. All right. So how did we get from that shitty and manual process to this really nice um, kind of fluid onboarding? Um, and it's also great, there's no touching from IT, they just kind of get their Macs and it's there and it's um, kind of enrolled in everything that it needs to be. All right, so standards for one. Now this comic, it's an example of bad standards. 
Um, I'm really advocating for the good kind. Try and pick them early. Um, you don't have to live with these choices forever, but make sure you've got a clear delineation when you do change standards. So for example, email standards, I'm not exaggerating. We've had all of these exist as email, all of these formats and conventions exist as email addresses for people at the moment. Um, it's not manageable and it's not scalable. So what we've done is we've settled on um, first dot last. It's great because sometimes you can't tell with names if that's where kind of the first name and the last name kind of cuts over. It's also good a lot of services when you actually put in an email address that's first dot last, it'll realize that that's actually a first name and a last name and pull that information in without you having to add that extra stuff. Um, the same goes for departments um, or teams or groups or whatever you're calling them. Um, so we did the same thing where we kind of picked this, uh, this standard where we're putting the team name first and then the actual name. Um, the reason behind that is so that in whatever system you're looking at, you can see clearly and easily these are all of my department or team groups and here are just extra ones like marketing email groups and stuff that's not a group of people. Um, so basically, how am I doing that in a consistent and scalable and, and uh, manageable way? Well, I'm using Okta. Um, it's basically single sign-on. It works really great. There's a number of different services you can use, things like OneLogin, though probably don't use them um, based on all the recent stuff that happened with them. Bidium Ping um, and Google is now getting into the SSO space. They don't have the, the range of stuff that are uh, all the integrations and the apps that Okta does. That's kind of why we picked them because they've got um, integration with so many. Um, and so from there, Okta is kind of managing everything, but our source of truth is still Active Directory. So that's the only time that I need to touch a Windows box is when I'm entering that data. So basically what happens is a new person starts and HR will add that person's um, information, their name, their team, their title, um, and who they report to. And they'll add that into their HRIS. And that will actually trigger off um, an email to be sent and pushes a card into Trello. And I get a list of, oh, okay, here's this person, I need to set them up. So once it kind of flows through, so I create, once I get that information in, in Trello, what I then do is go into AD, I create the user, I add them to the appropriate group, adding all their team name, and then I run a manual sync on Okta. What that does is that pulls it in, I confirm that all the information is correct, and then once it's in Okta, it then gets pushed out to all the different services, um, and all of this stuff gets provisioned automatically, they get added to the right groups across all the services, and everything just kind of works. And it's really nice, because now, rather than having you know, multiple services that you might log in with Google, and I've got all these passwords for all these different um, applications, now I'm just logging with Okta, and that's it. So this is kind of where the team prefix comes in handy. It just kind of delineates where all those team names are, then I've got some office names um, for other groups uh, which flow through to other applications. Okay. Um, Google is really bad at sorting. It doesn't actually like to let you sort by the name, so it's one example of why I chose the team prefix first. Um, and here's where some fun happens because I'm using Okta. So because I'm pushing information in from um, Active Directory and their group, and then that comes into Okta, and I also got, I've also got their kind of title, Okta can do some smarts where it can match titles and go, okay, I'm gonna make a smart group out of all of these people, and then I can push them through. So I pull in that, uh, that this person started in Melbourne, and what's gonna happen is they're gonna be added to a Melbourne group, and that group is gonna get pushed through to Slack. Um, and what Slack's able to do is you can then, on the Slack side of things, define uh, this group, you can have a, a name, and then it can go ahead and have 
all of these default channels for these people. So it really makes the setup experience a lot nicer for new people. They come in, they join Slack, and oh, I'm already in all the Melbourne channels, and I'm also in the customer, I'm also a customer person, so I'm in the customer group, and everything just works. All right. So I'm using Typeform, um, it's kind of like a pretty Google Forms, to figure out what equipment New Campus want. So what happens is they'll get this nice little um, type form where they put in their name, where they're going to be joining us, pick their computer, have they used a Mac before, pick their accessories, um, and shirt size, we give them t-shirts because they're a startup, and that's what startups do. <laughs> um, and yes, I did add this after the talk yesterday. Um, so. That ends on a bad bit. Um, so that information then flows through. Um, so one of the reasons why I now ask where that person works is I've kind of changed the model of how we're giving people computers. We still let them choose, but we've shifted to a model of I'm going to order a bunch of Macs for like the next three months and I'm going to set defaults. So by default, all of these people get 13-inch MacBook Pros. If they do want something else, they can ask for it, but it's not the standard and there's a chance that it might not be there on day one, depending on when they give me that notice. So it kind of makes my life a bit easier. It also sets the expectation that these people, this is what you get, and everyone's got the same thing. So once they submit that form, it's picked up by Zapier. It's kind of like IFT, but on steroids and for business use. Um, and it grabs the form, and then what it does is it will get that type form, get all that information in. It will then find the Trello card, which is just by going in and searching for that person's name. It's then going to um, create a comment on that card um, where, where it steps out all of that information. And then I get a notification saying, hey, here's all this stuff, uh, go ahead and order it. And I've also set it now to set me Slack reminders. So some great things just to to prompt me a bit more to make sure that I've got all this stuff. Um, that's what the comment will look like on that person's onboarding card. And I've got a bunch of checklists that I also use Zapier for. So a card will come in and it will see, oh, this person's title looks like that. OK, I'm going to add these extra checks that need to happen um, so that then I can mark off and go, hey, OK, this person needs, um, you know, this person's a designer, they need Adobe and whatnot, and then kind of go from there. All right, so as you can guess, I'm using Jamf for all of this in the back end. Um, so how we're doing it, it's all through DEP. We've got, obviously we've got offices all over the world, but um, the great thing is you can have as many DEP accounts as you want and you can filter them all into Jamf um, and they all kind of roll in there. So what happens is we've got several pre-stages based on uh, the type of Mac that we're trying to set up. So I've also got one for Office Macs, which is um, when I get a Mac Mini to set up a new meeting room, then I'll unassign it from the default, assign it to that, and then it becomes just a it knows to go ahead and put Zoom rooms on there and do that sort of thing. Um, so by default, all of our Macs come into this default enrollment. And what that does is I've basically bypassed all the steps, um, apart from location services. I leave that on just so that it sets the time automatically for them when they check it. That's the only reason that it's still there. Um, all the other stuff, we're not restricting Apple IDs. We're not restricting Touch ID or Apple Pay. They can set that up if they want, but I really want that unboxing experience to be as just seamless as possible and just, okay, you're starting a new job. This is stressful. Let me make this little part of it a bit easier. Um, so once they've entered in their credentials, as you saw in that little video at the start, um, once it hits the desktop, you see that really nice splash screen that came up? So what I'm using is um, Splash Buddy. So it's an open source tool. Um, it's on GitHub. It's uh, very similar to Trigger, which was talked about yesterday. There's a number of them out there. 
I've kind of settled on this one because I kind of like it. Um, I need to do a bit more work on that little, so that uh, little window there where I've got all that text, that's actually just a web view with an HTML page. So you can pump in as much information. I just haven't had the time to put extra stuff in there. And what you're able to do is all of these applications on the right hand side, I wonder if this will work. Yeah, there we go, all of these. Um, <laughs> Bit of magic in the presentation. Um, you just define them in a plist. You've got all the icons there, and when it installs, it will then look against your Jamf log and go and say, "Okay, is this item started to be installed?" Well, it'll go orange, and then when it's completed, it'll go green, and it'll work really nicely. Okay. So the way that I set this off is. Um, through an enrollment policy as kind of enrollment complete. This is my only enrollment complete policy. Um, so really I want this to happen as soon as possible. At the moment, it kind of takes about, depending on the day and DEP, <laughs> which could sometimes mean a long time. Um, generally, especially on everything post 10, 12, 5, DEP got a bit quicker after that. Um, it'll take about 10 to 15 seconds once that user hits the desktop. And once they've hit the desktop, about 15 seconds later, um, the enrollment policies will complete and this will show up straight away. Um, I'd really love to get this staged on the machine beforehand. And I know that there's a way to do that through install application, through the DP, but we don't get access to that at the moment. So it'd be really great to be able to use that to speed up that process um, because I've got checks in with Splash Buddy to make sure that it doesn't actually launch until there's a user session active. It won't open up during the setup of system. Okay. Um, yeah, so as I said, it installs that, you pick that. Um, they've got this nice little continue button, but I actually leave that grayed out. Um, and you can do that by making some of these policies optional. So, oh, sorry, required. Uh, so that last one, that cleaning up, removing setup files, it actually points to nothing, so it'll never install so the user can never hit continue. Because what I'm actually doing is um, I used to actually bundle an enrollment script with Splash Buddy. Now I've actually moved this script um, into Jamf. Um, so what will happen is Splash Buddy will install and then it'll run this script. And the, basically all I'm doing is I'm just calling a bunch of custom triggers. And down the bottom here, it's kind of where the fun stuff happens. So um, I'm basically telling Splash Buddy to quit, I'm removing it and killing it, um, and then I'm forcing the user to log out. Now, once they're logged out, then they go ahead and log back in and file vaults enabled and it all works brilliantly. Um, okay, I just realized that I've got to the end of my slides and I'm really, really, I've sped through that, I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, there's a lot of stuff that I'd like to do and improve upon this process. Um, it's kind of great at the moment, um, but there's more I can do. There's things like um, we've also got another document which I'd like to work on, which is this giant, huge behemoth of a document for setting up your developer environment. And for new devs when they start, that takes them a good day to actually get through that. And I've looked at it and I've gone, you know what, I can probably automate this and kind of get this happening. I already know what someone's position is. I know that they can kind of come in and say, oh, this one's an engineer. Okay, cool. After all of this completes, I can have another policy to go out and push out all of that information and kind of get it up and running for them and really simplify that process even more. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. We've got a lot of time now, so if people have any questions about this, please let me know. <laughs> Um, yeah, oh, here we go, first question. Hello, I'm just wondering how you confirm that there's an active user logged in? Yes, um, so there's a little bit in, um, so where do I put that? So inside the script, I'm looking for a particular user. So I'm looking to make sure that it's not the underscore MB setup user. Um, and I'm also making sure that there's, um, the doc is active, because that won't happen. Yep. So I'm doing that way to, f to make sure. Does um, Splash Buddy, do you have to be logged in for Splash Buddy to work, or can that uh, work over the login screen? 
I haven't tried it over the login screen. Um, it won't work at the moment because uh, the checks are set to run to make sure that a user is logged in. But if I remove those checks, it's basically got a launch daemon that is checking every 10 seconds to see if these criteria are met. So there's no reason why it couldn't actually run um, over the login window. I think the initial idea was the dimensions of it were set so that it could actually run over the top of the setup assistant and it would just kind of match that. Um, but obviously you can't push stuff out there at the moment. So yes. All right, let me try and get that working. <laughs> oh, hey, it worked. So the reason why I spent so long in this bloody thing was because I synced up the iPhone with it. Make, so once the magic happens, the person logs in, they're then prompted to set up uh, either or. I prefer OctaVerify. They kind of open the app. Kind of click next. They go ahead and they scan this little barcode and then that's the push done. So what happens then is when we've set our users to be prompt for a second factor every um, seven days. So it's kind of good that if they do it on a Monday, they're gonna get prompted next Monday. Um, once they set that second factor up, they're prompted to change their password and then they're kind of logged in and they see their dashboard. Um, so the great thing, if you are using Okta, I would highly recommend pushing out Okta Verify to your users as the app of choice rather than, um, rather than uh, Google Authenticator. One, you're not kind of reaching into your, uh, your pocket, grab the phone, read the code, type it in. With um, Okta Verify, you can set it to automatically send you a push notification. And if you've got the Apple Watch, what will happen is you land on the website, oh, you need to authenticate. It sends you a push automatically. You get the notification on your watch. And because your watch is kind of logged in and authenticated, you can just tap approve. And then a second later, you're logged in on the desktop. It's a really smooth workflow. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do. It's all about trying to simplify the user experience and make things a bit smoother. How have you found this has gone with remote users in different countries and different time zones? That's an excellent question and it's gone really well because there's no, at the moment, there's no presence of IT. We're hiring someone in San Francisco at the moment, but there's no um, presence of IT over there. So I actually have our office managers, our experience managers doing the onboarding in our other offices. Um, so because it's so self-service and I've got um, these guides there, they step through the process and I just hear back, it's worked. Cool, that's great, that's what I wanna hear. Um, if they've got any kind of feedback, I'll take it on. Um, the next step is actually, so I, I've been finding, I've been watching the um, kind of the onboarding sessions and once their Mac is set up and that all works great, then the person doing the onboarding goes ahead and says, oh okay, now can you open up Chrome and can you go to this website and can you install this Chrome uh, extension and we're going to have a look at these apps and I'm like oh do you do that every time and she's like yes yes I do I'm like hey I can automate that so I'm going to put a little um, button in self-service for start onboarding and just have it um, scoped to people who have been there for less than seven days or whatnot um, and then I'm also going to start pushing out those uh, Chrome extensions automatically and actually managing that um, it's just kind of the next thing on the list of things to do to make lives easier and try to get this working a bit better. Uh, we've got a little bit of time before lunch is ready, so if, if anybody's got any, any questions or yep. would, um, like to come and uh, speak to James, feel free. <laughs> I'll stand up, stretch your legs, move around. Oh, thank you.